Hi, this is Elaine. As I promised um, in the series of Adult Children of Alcoholics 12-step um, program, I decided to share with you steps two and three today. But as I went through step two, I realized it really needs its own video. So <laughs> by the time we're done with this, there'll be a whole bunch of videos. Uh, so I'm gonna just jump right into it. The second one is came to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. So um, there's a lot to unpack here. I, that's why I really needed, it needs its own video. Uh, because, well, I think we have some really big things to talk about. Sanity is, is one. And the higher power. So I think I want to tackle the um, power greater than ourselves or you know, higher power, um, because I think that, I think it keeps a lot of people out of recovery, the fact that this is a spiritual program. Almost any program that you attempt to do to help you with emotional sobriety, to help you with recovery, is going to have a spiritual component. Um, a spiritual component does not have to mean a belief in a certain God or a certain religion or even God at all. Um, I think we all can recognize that we have a sort of a spiritual spirituality, a certain, we have certain spiritual principles. They're those, um, those things that guide us, you know, the things that drive, you know, it's not just our mental, um, like logical and rational thinking, uh, but it's also something that directs us you know, it may be in our heart. It's, it doesn't seem very scientific for some people. Um, and some people have a lot of reasons for not um, wanting to think in term, uh, terms of spirituality at all, or especially not to think of, it, of somebody or a, an entity called God. And that shouldn't keep you from recovery because there's no reason that you have to adopt any kind of religion or faith to follow this 12 step program. I mean, there are other programs, but I still think you're going to come up against the idea of a spiritual awakening. I think that's, that's, there's no way around it. So I want to talk about that first because it says a power greater than ourselves. There's a really good reason for this. First of all, in the program, we, um, we feel out of control. We absolutely cannot keep depending on other people to help us feel in control. And we cannot continue to control other people in order to help us feel in control. There's a, there's a certain amount of letting go that has to happen. We have to let go. But when we let go, um, who's directing the ship? Do we, do we just go off and in into the, the blue and um, wherever the wind takes us? I don't, I don't think so. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to be a little bit, dive into my own like personal thing, just very briefly about my feelings. I was in my adolescence, a very religious uh, girl and this was good for me. I mean, I came from a dysfunctional family. I suddenly wasn't in that family anymore and I was living in other people's homes and under their different rules and having to adjust. And I came upon um, my church. And I have to say it was a, a pretty good church because the people were very supportive. They were very loving. They, they encouraged me and they welcomed me and they embraced me. And then I came to a spiritual awakening, I guess you could say, at that church. But... Um, and it was very important and informed my life. It helped me get through a lot of things that probably kept me out of trouble too. But I had fun. I had friends. I had um, music. I had the scriptures. And, you know, some of the scriptures I couldn't relate to, but many of them were helpful to me. So I don't look down on that time of my life, or, um, but I for a while I did. I went to college and... I was exposed to a lot of other ideas and other types of people and people of other faiths and people of no faith um, and people who had spirituality but didn't necessarily believe in a God. 
And instead of this being like a comfort to me, this, this threw me into chaos. And I, I pretty much abandoned my, my particular faith. Also, I didn't like what was happening in my church. It had, it had gone into political realms that I didn't agree with. And um, it began to be less about love and forgiveness, you know, and more about punishment and sin. So I couldn't accept that that was a place that people would want to come and, and find happiness or recovery or comfort or anything. It had changed. So many years later, I, well, it actually went into a deep depression over it. It was very difficult to find myself. It was like being abandoned again. I find myself in this situation where I couldn't accept my faith anymore. I couldn't believe in it. And then I, then I questioned like, who was I, you know, <laughs> during that time? I mean, this could be another reason that you come to, um, a program like adult children of alcoholics and dysfunctional families is because you may have even had a loss of faith. And I'm not saying come back to the faith because that's not always the answer. I'm not saying believe in God. If you can't feel a belief in God, that's fine. But you need to def decide because you feel out of control, because you have tried people to help you um, feel safe and they have tried to use you to feel safe. Uh, there's a certain feeling of being lost in the world if you don't have a spiritual practice of some sort. And again, does not have to be God. So what I, when I say a um, higher power, and I'm going to tell you, there are days when I have a trouble conceiving of God as being there. You know, I mean, that's kind of where I am. We'll just say is believing in a higher power and we'll just leave it at that. So your higher power, um, we can just talk about it really quickly. It can be um, the universe. If you can think of the universe as loving, you know, maybe because it makes the mountains and it makes the trees and it makes the animals and it created love in us to love other people. Whatever is that creative force, you could think of that and, and not have to define it. And um, some people might have trouble with God because they say, well, why does God allow all this bad in the world? And I can't answer that question for, for you because I would say that we as humans are here with free will and we do things to each other and things go go wrong. Um, a lot of that is because many people don't come to terms with their own self, with their self-love. We can't fix them. We can't save them. We can only save ourselves. So the, we think of, we want to blame God, or if we don't believe in God, because why would God do such a thing? Um, again, I think what we have to do is just make a personal God for ourselves and however you want to envision that. I sometimes use the idea of a higher consciousness, that there's a spiritual consciousness, because we all have consciousness. And sometimes our best ideas and our best care, the, the love that we have for each other in our best selves, we reach a, a state of consciousness that's really amazing. Um, and so I find it is also my best self, Maybe I've never achieved my best self. I don't even know what my best self is. But sometimes it, it seems like I'm better on certain days than others. But I like to think of it as that potential for the best self that I could be. And it might seem like that enough for some people. I don't know. And I don't want you to struggle over this. Because even if you have to just do it in a metaphorical context, thinking about... Uh, a God or a some sort of a um, consciousness or belief system or something, whatever you can surrender yourself to. So um, anyway, I would suggest you don't skip over this step if that's a problem for you. Now, if you are a, a very strong believer in God or Jesus Christ or, um, you know, in Allah, whatever you're 
your faith is, there could still be a problem because sometimes we think of our our God or our higher power as a, a manipulative God or a mean God or a gotcha God or a God that's going to punish you or a God that um, is just waiting for you to make a mistake, you know, or a God that um, enables you and, and says, well, that's okay, you know, I I accept that you did this bad thing and hey, you keep doing it, it's okay. So, you know, um, sometimes it's just like, even if we believe in God, we have unhelpful ideas about who God is because, you know, who are we as humans to, to try to de define who God is? We don't really know. We can't really see. Um, and when we think we know, sometimes that's a problem too. It's even a form of control that is not healthy in this program. So I don't know. I, I find this to be the most complicated thing. I'm not here to sell the program again. There's so many other things you can do. I think it's, for me, was one of the best programs. And so I had to come to terms with a, with a higher power. And um, so bear with me. And if you... If you want to go on, this is like, <laughs> this is an important step. Okay, so we're going to look at the other word, which is sanity. Because this step actually hinges on sanity more than anything. The, the higher power thing is actually going to come up more in step three. So let's just, um, let's concentrate on what sanity is. Now, we are all very, I'm looking for the, the right thing for you. Okay, well, let's first talk about what insanity is. S sanity or sane, actually in Spanish, the word that's close to sane is healthy. I love that. In fact, it'd be much better to use that. Um, I don't even know what the, the whole word is in Spanish, but I know that the root word is san or sana. So... Sanity is health. We want to be healthy. It's very simple. But let's talk about insanity and what is not healthy. Okay, so insanity. You've heard this before. People have said this before, probably, that you've heard. Uh, repeating the same mistake and expecting different results. Okay, so... That is what dysfunction is, okay? So that's this whole thing, dysfunctional families. It's if what we were doing was functional, our life would feel probably more sane. But it's not functional or else you wouldn't be here. Again, I say that again, you are here because you want like to be functional and happy. So dysfunctional it kind of means you keep doing that dysfunction. You know, it's away from function. It's not functioning. And so that's not sane when we keep trying to do this. Now, this step talks a lot about our relationships with other people. Uh, again, you usually come to a program like this because of, often because you have a breakup or you're about to break up with somebody or you just got divorced or... Um, or you lost somebody that, you know, that, that person was very important to you and you you depended on that person a lot. And so you come to a program with that response. It's usually about somebody else. I, I hate to say that, but that is really what we're here doing is we're like <laughs> trying to recover. And what we're doing is we're trying to fix our dysfunction from when we were kids with other people. So we had problems as kids. We go out looking in the world for somebody and we think we can fix the dysfunction through another person. And you know that's true. Most, I mean, most of you viewing know that you look for somebody that's gonna fix all this, okay? Or you can fix them and act out like the fixing that you couldn't do with your parents or your your biological, you, you know, your biological parents or your caregivers. You go to this other person and you try to fix them because at least you could do that. 
while you can while you live right so it's that's insane too but we'll talk about that so we'll start out with what was your role as a kid and because not everybody's the same in this world of dysfunction we are we had different roles that we took on and sometimes it's, it's uncanny that if you had like four or five kids in your family let's say you're from a five five kid um, household each one might have played a different role it's not uncommon it's almost like there's a vacuum you know for a role if there isn't that already okay so for instance what role did you play and there are other roles but these are kind of like the typical roles there's the hero now the hero is the one that wants to fix honestly the hero sometimes has to actually be a parent to his or her siblings or the hero actually has to be a parent to her parents or his parents you know you have to always take care of things and take on roles and um you know you're doing like most of the household work or the most of the cooking and most of the cleaning and um taking care of the other kids and stuff so it's like the family can't function without you. And even as a little kid, you might've been taken on that role as a hero. So then in your life, you, you don't want anybody to like control you. You're gonna control everybody else because that's what you had to do as a kid, you see? So in relationships, you cross boundaries to make your life better or you think you need to pick somebody out that you can fix. Now, I'm going to call that different than a person who is a rescuer, okay? Although it's definitely can be the same thing. But the hero is honestly taking on a lot more than he or she should have taken on as a kid. And then that's what you do in life. You, you just take on more than you should. You can't say no, you know? You can't say, no, I, I, I don't want to do that. I can't choose that. That's not for me. Or I've got enough on my plate, thank you. You just keep on taking more things on. You want to head committees because you think you're the only one that can do that. You know, you're going to join causes. And causes are great. No, not, not taking away from that. But if you haven't done this work, you will kind of malfunction at some point. If you are that hero, you're going to take on those causes. And you're going to wonder, why, why isn't anybody else here helping me with these causes? You know, I'm doing it all by myself. And yet, that's what you signed up for, to do it. Because maybe you didn't trust other people to do it. Okay, you might have been the scapegoat. Maybe you were the whipping boy or whipping girl. You were the one. Anytime anything went wrong, I don't know why this happens. Why does it that the parents don't go after all the kids? We, I guess in some homes they do, but um, the scapegoat, though, I don't know. You have a big target on your head that says, hey, uh, if I, I'll feel better if I, you know, like they go after you because they feel better if they, they hit you or attack you or hurt you or blame you or just use psychological um, blackmail on you. You're just, you're just the one. If some other kid did something, it, you probably instigated it. So as a scapegoat, you're going to get it. You know, you're expected to take care of everybody else. You know, maybe the hero is also a scapegoat, but usually if there's already a hero, then they can get us, you can have a scapegoat. And the hero might take the role of trying to stick up for the scapegoat. You know, that's okay too. I mean, it's, a, it's okay. It's just that that, can happen in adult life, it's not good. But if you're a scapegoat, um, you just feel like you've got the target on your back and you can become a victim. So in adult life, you go on like, every time something happens, it's like always me. Why do they blame me? Why is it always me? Um, and you know, it might always be you, but it might also be because you don't know how to stand up for yourself. You, and you, you have trouble seeing yourself as somebody who can overcome things or who has, I don't know, a personality that is separate from what the labels have been and all the, the abusive labels. So maybe in adulthood, you look for, weird, right? You look for somebody to keep doing that to you. 
you know, to keep attacking you. You were the one that were hit, was hit. You, you seek that out. Why? Now that's insane, right? But it's true. It might be because that person doesn't think they deserve differently. Maybe they are keep, keep hoping that they can change somebody who's scapegoating them in adult life. And maybe they, they want to fix that in some way. But instead, they find some controlling and abusive person to do that to them again. I don't, I don't understand these things, but I guess I've probably done them myself and not recognized it. So, okay, the rescuer might be a little different than the hero, all right? Because that person um, might have to be the one that just sort of cleans up the messes, you know, and protects, like, the other, the other vulnerable ones may be the one that protects the scapegoat. Um, that person is looking for people to fix, okay? So maybe not necessarily the hero who's heading up the causes and, and trying to do all the work, but the rescue's try, rescuer is usually has a kind heart, a good heart, and that, that person is always having to be fixing another person too, okay? So they're they are going to an adult life look for people to rescue they're going to spend a lot of their own money to uh, bail that bail other people out they're going to try to um they're going to be sympathetic to somebody who keeps on having problems so they're going to like i i'm the one who can help you i can i can come in there and i'll scoop you up and we'll make your life better okay and and i'm going to do it it's a little arrogant, you know, but we don't think of it that way because we actually, you know, want to help people. We think this is a good thing it's, and it's not a bad thing, but we, we can go too far for people who will never change and for people who do not um, even want to change, maybe, you know, or they might say, oh yeah, I'm going to try to get my life together. I'm, you know, I'm going to, the end of this week, I'm going to stop drinking and I'm going to, um, you know, I'm going to try to get a job. And maybe as the rescuer, you're looking up the jobs for that person. You know, instead of them taking initiative and like look going online and looking for job openings or something. You might be like, that sounds familiar to me. I mean, I know I've done stuff like that. So, you know, that might be who I am, rescuer. I don't know. But um, that is... Well, we'll talk about that. All those things are like okay in some respects because all this function has like a inverse thing. Like there's the extreme of it and that gets you into trouble. And then there's another side that might be okay if you temper it. But don't please don't think that I'm saying it's okay to be any of these things because it's not, not really. Okay, and there's the lost child. Um, the lost child is... So imagine we've got the family, maybe we you don't have to have four kids in a family with different roles, but let's just say that there's a child in a family, maybe you were that child, and you are very, you don't want to get hit, and you're not brave enough to stand up to anybody, and you're certainly not the hero, and maybe you're not even the scapegoat, you just stay back. You know, you know that if you're very quiet and you don't speak out and if you just keep to yourself, you know, maybe even hide in the closet, just like as long as you can't be seen. You might even do this in the classroom. Think about that. Were you the one that sat in the back all the time and never answered questions? And if you were asked a question, you, you just froze. So... The lost child really feels abandoned. Some reason didn't get attention and just kind of got accustomed to not getting attention and, and not good at, or maybe not even bad attention, but certainly gets to see all the dysfunction around. And that person might really have trouble forming attachments in adult life. That's the kind of person that maybe doesn't get into a relationship um, and just prefers to be a loner or gets into a relationship very fearfully and never sticks up for himself or herself um, and expects to be abandoned and expects to be a lost child again. 
So you might pick people, you might pick people who will abandon you. In fact, all these, all these types tend to do that. They're going to be abandoned in some way. But the lost child will seek that out because ultimately it's safer to be alone. So maybe they get into a relationship, but that's actually a relief in saying, okay, I, I'm leaving, you know, because it's just easier. But there's that sense of feeling that that's not really what they want in life, but not knowing what to do. So when we have these relationships with people, and I, I'm going to tell you still, even today, it would be hard for me to choose a healthy individual because I still feel like I need to work these steps, but I have a lot better idea. I can see somebody, I can say, oh, that person needs me. Oh, maybe I'm trying to rescue that person, you know, or I'm going to take on this cause and I'm going to, you know, speak out for everybody. That's definitely me too. Um, and finding that like resentment because I'm, I'm doing it by myself or something or with not enough help or support or whatever it is. Um, I've been scapegoated. I understand that. And anyway, all these rules, um, we do act them out. Either we repeat them. Um, well, that's what we do. So we repeat the same mistake. Okay. Expecting different results. Um, and that is what gets us into a program because it's insane. It's not insane like, um, you know, clinical, although it could become clinical. Um, it's just, it's not making sense. So I like to think of it in the term of sane and healthy, and we want to be healthy. And we, and we're not selfish by rejecting these, these roles in our adult life, you know, by not rescuing, by not being a hero. Okay, that's not selfish. So, you know, and we, we don't have to be helpless either, like in the other two roles, like the loner. And, and there's also the black sheep. The, the, I didn't put that down. Um, sometimes it's just somebody who's a rebel. And they're not going to do any of this stuff. See, they're, a rebel's not going to be well, maybe a hero, but not for the family. They're going to go off. You know, they're not sticking around. They're a rebel. Um, they're not necessarily going to rescue anybody. Uh, you know, maybe they were the last child, but I doubt it because they don't have that strength of rebelliousness. Okay. Uh, or maybe they were scapegoated a lot and became rebellious, but whatever. Black sheep of the family um, is just going to be the mal is a malcontent, is angry, maybe a cynical. It's still another role. And it's, not necessarily the healthy role, although sometimes we embrace that. So that's, again, it's not bad entirely. It's just that when you keep repeating it and you keep getting the wrong results. Um, so much of this has to do with control. And I've talked about this before, but control is just, is a problem with boundaries. We can only, um, in this program anyway, so I'm not saying don't help people and don't love people, don't rescue people. I don't mean any of that. I don't mean embrace your being selfish or anything because it's not a selfish thing. But when we control others, even if it's sort of like um, not, we don't think it's that obvious. People feel it. They feel that you want them, that, you know, to do something. Uh, you want another person to do something. You, Maybe it's because you want it and you just want to see another person do it because vicariously you can see them do that thing or buy something, you know, <laughs> you can't buy it, but hey, if you buy it, it'd be kind of fun. Like you'll have it and I get to see. So um, when we, we either let ourselves be controlled or we control others, we're crossing boundaries. So boundaries, you know, we have us, we're inside this boundary. When we let people inside our boundaries, it's because we're ready for intimacy. And even then, so we have, find a partner that we're ready to be intimate. And I don't mean in the sexual way, although that's, you know, part of it. But when we, um, and we have intimacy with those who are not, 
our romantic partners as well. We have close relationships. But when we allow people to get further into our boundaries, maybe it's because we really trust them. Sometimes though, we let people cross our boundaries that we shouldn't because they're not ready. We, we can't trust them yet. And we should not go into other people's boundaries, even if we think we're helping, because sometimes that's just enabling them th that they don't have to do their work. And, and we can't, we can't control the fact that they don't want to begin a program like this. Okay. So, um, let's see, what have I covered? So I'm going to go back to this. Okay. Um, so I'm going to look at it again, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. So, um, so back, let's see, can, should we go back? Oh, anyway, let's, let's talk about this word, codependency. I looked it up and it seemed to be saying, I dropped some things, sorry. <laughs> it seemed to be saying a lot of different things. My understanding of it was, um, you get in a relationship and you enable that person to do a thing that they maybe shouldn't do. Um, and they, they allow you. So it's a bit, and, and you rely on each other, but it's not in a healthy way. It's kind of relying in each, on each other to do the unhealthy things. Other people have called it um, a, just an over-dependence on a person instead of on our own power. So I find it a little confusing looking it up, but I think both explanations are pretty good. So if you think of yourself as having an over reliance on another person. It could be because you want them to control you because you're scared. Uh, or it could be you have a reliance to control another person so you don't have to deal with yourself. Um, that's a dependence. It's a dependence and it's not healthy. And it's not like the kind of dependence you have as a baby because you have to. When you're, when you're a baby or a toddler or a little kid, you depend on your parents and it's natural and it's normal because you can't do otherwise. But as an adult, it shouldn't be that your reason for living is that other person and you're afraid for them to go or to leave. You know, you just are so attached to them that you, you can't live without them. That means that your whole reason for living is summed up in this other person. If they leave you, who are you? What do you have left? So that's not good, but it's also that enabling back and forth, back and forth. You know, I'll stay with you if you let me do this thing, okay? And then the other person will just let them do that thing. They enable them. That's a dependency too. So um, anyway, codependency, look it up for yourself. Decide what you think it is. It's probably everything you, <laughs> everything you read about it. There are whole books written just on codependency. So the reason why we want to talk about the higher power in this is because we don't want to put our faith in a person. Now, we might have a sponsor. Again, we've talked about this, having a sponsor in um, ACA. And it is hard in this time of the, whatever we want to call this, this, um, pandemic thing, whatever it is, uh, we don't, we don't have as much access to groups. We don't have as much access to sponsors and there are not as many people. There are not a whole lot of people that have finished their 12 steps that could be your sponsor, but if you could find somebody that's wonderful, but I I'll tell you, I did a little internet search this morning and there's a lot of people that have done 12 step videos. And um, I don't know how you wanna do it, but you need to get to a point where you can do this program and you don't have to depend on people that aren't dependable, you know? Um, you may have to do this by yourself, but with some support, at least somebody acknowledging that you're doing this hard work. Tell them how important it is that you do this work. And that it's okay that they don't understand the work, you know, and if they're even willing to listen to you. 
But I think the best thing is to find somebody else who wants to do the program. You just have to respect each other's boundaries, but do it together, understanding, you know, that you're doing the work, they're doing the work, and nobody is going to depend on anybody else, but you need to share. Okay, so now the goal of all this, I think, is this. And self-love is the place where you want to be. If you have self-love, you don't have to do that. If you have self-love, you don't have to let other people trigger you. You don't have to have other people control you, and you don't have to control other people. Now, self-love is not selfish. Um, I think there are people that are raised in households that say, don't think of yourself, always think about others. Your focus should be about others. And this is a lot in like religious households too. That you need to help others and to take your mind off yourself and your own problems. You need to deny your own problems and you need to take care of other people. You need to serve other people. Your purpose on this earth is to serve others. And there's joy in serving others. And you know there is. But I'm going to tell you right now, especially when we talk about, let's look at this hero. You might think a person that's a hero in the family has a lot of self-love because they have all this belief and strength that they can do it. But a lot of times, that's the kind of the wrong kind of strength because it's still dependent on other and fixing other people. A person that has self-love understands boundaries. If somebody, if we're if we're attached to somebody, we really, really love somebody and we're dependent on that person and they leave us, instead of completely falling apart and you, you will have a hard time if you love somebody and they leave you, it's difficult. There's just like no way around it. Um, and you should just maybe even block out some time to grieve, you know, just say, guess what? Uh, I just, this thing happened in my life. I, I know the drill is going to be hard. I've got to spend some time working on some things. And that's got to be honored, okay? But how do you do that? How do you not stay ruminating and ruminating over the person that left you, okay? Or maybe you even kicked that person out of your life. Well, maybe good for you because maybe they needed to go. But maybe that was that thing where you abandoned someone before they abandoned you. So you're still in this like psycho ah it's crazy but self-love enables you to say i am okay alone i am okay with myself when you trigger me i don't have to take it seriously i can have emotional health because i love myself it's really hard to say i love myself when you're in this program i think the thing that's the most obvious is that saying you love yourself is a lot of people just don't believe it um, there's an exercise it's in this book and you are supposed to look in a mirror and say I love you and say it like repeatedly and believe it right and you know what happens when you say it say it sometimes in this program you break out in tears because you you just can't accept it and you realize that you have all this stuff, this not believing in yourself. It came from whatever dysfunction in your family that you really didn't understand what it meant to be loved. And I am not saying that your family didn't love you, but they didn't know how to do it in a functional way. So it didn't communicate, you know, or it seemed like love. And maybe they didn't, you know, maybe you came from a narcissistic uh you had a narcissistic parent. It's really hard for a narcissistic parent to understand how to love their kids because everything that the kids have to do to validate them, they still and need and want and just, oh, they just feel they need your validation all the time and they control you and they bully you and they're mean and you're just a kid. How are you going to give an adult validation? So finding self-love after you have all these other messages that you have to 
think of others first and not yourself. Um, or that you have to always seek approval from other people. Or that you have to control other people to make life good. That's not self-love. Self-love means you're already okay. Now, we may not feel it. We still have to go, I think, through this program. But there's that sense that I'm enough. I am enough. And I will have to figure that out. The program will get you to that point of self-love. That is, to me, that's like the most wonderful thing. That's the thing that in the program, um, that's the end result. And I think your higher power helps you with that. It's, it's that ability to break up with your uh, your self-abuse, your self-hatred, your um, critical voice, and all that stuff. It doesn't mean that you don't mess up or that you're perfect. And it doesn't mean that you can't help other people or any of those things. But it just means that if you want to be a functional person in the world, you better first learn to love yourself. And it's going to be your default setting. is going to be a lot better than the default setting you had before. Anything that comes up, I love myself. Okay, doesn't mean you could do any kind of wrong and you could always just say, I love myself, so it's okay. No, <laughs> no, you still have a conscience. You still have to behave in ways that are acceptable in society, of course. But self-love is, is about forgiveness and it's about finding your identity. And it's the most wonderful thing. I can say now that I have self-love. If I feel enamored of somebody and I get in a little you know ideation about it um, I have to remind myself that hey whatever happens I love myself I'm not arrogant about it I just love myself I have to live with myself my whole life I may as well love that person that I live with so um, if I have to be single that's fine so um, I have a relationship with myself and that's the important thing and you want to get to that point even if you really want to be in a relationship you're more likely to be in a good one because somebody will say hey look at that person she loves herself in other words she has self-respect she has self-dignity she's self-actualized she's perfectly comfortable in her own skin she has good boundaries she respects my boundaries. That's self-love. So anyway, uh, the next one that we're going to do, I don't know if this went long. See why I, I always end up with 45-minute videos because I am such a talker. And if you listen to my videos, thank you for being like so good about that because you could probably listen to a, a fancier um production and you know <laughs> you are listening to me if you're here still thank you the next step will be made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand God again that definition you know we whatever one we made about how we're going to think of our higher power we'll just do it that way um so we under came to the understanding in step two but in step three we turn it over and that's going to help a lot so we'll talk about that in the next video and thanks for um hanging in there and thanks for doing a good job for yourself in your own program i thank you because it's my job sort of on my 12th step to um to share with others uh again not dependent upon others but you can serve others, I think, when you feel like you've gone through this program and you, you're always learning. So, okay, well, thank you. I hope you have a wonderful day and keep coming back. It works if you work it. Thank you.